Hi there everybody, Professor Tomney here, back with another Chem Complete video in the thermodynamic lecture series. And in today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion about the basics of thermodynamics by looking at heat in a little more detail, including the heat of a reaction and enthalpy. So we will take a look at that coming up on the channel right now. Okay, so heat of reaction and enthalpy. So if you did not see the previous lecture that went over the first law of thermodynamics and some of the basics about systems, surroundings, energy conservation, and so on, I would strongly encourage you to watch that. So you can either find it in the thermodynamics playlist, or I will leave a link to that direct lecture down in the section below. If you go into the text box below the video, I will have it down there. So this is a brief recap at the beginning here because we did discuss this at the end of that lecture I just mentioned. Heat, which is represented by a lowercase q in chemistry, is defined as the energy transfer into or out of a system and it's going to result from differences in temperature. So specifically, if there's a difference in temperature between a system and its surroundings, you will get heat. It's going to be a flow of energy. So when we look at heat, heat has a certain principle, and this is guided by entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, which we will be discussing in another upcoming lecture. However, heat always flows from higher temperature areas or regions to lower temperature areas or regions. And it will continue to do that until a state of thermal equilibrium is established. Okay, so uh, one of the things we're going to talk about in an uh, upcoming lecture is the concept of absolute zero. And you have to realize for absolute zero to exist, there could be no heat anywhere else in the universe because that uh, higher temperature, right? I should say that there can't be a higher temperature than absolute zero anywhere in the universe because if there were, then that heat energy would continue to flow towards the area of absolute zero and try to bring it up into thermal equilibrium. All right, so that is just a recap on heat. And again, in that previous lecture that I mentioned, we discussed the difference between heat and temperature. So temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a system that you're taking a reading for. That is very closely tied in with heat, but it is not heat itself. So heat and temperature are different from one another. Now, this gets into what we want to talk about in regards to heat of reactions. So when we talk about the heat of a reaction, we can view it in one of two ways. A reaction may have heat that is going to be absorbed by the reaction, or we could be talking about a reaction that is going to release heat when it occurs. But either of those instances in a chemical system are referred to as a heat of reaction. And we usually are going to assign this uh, concept or this standard uh, value for enthalpy to that particular thing. So when we take a look, these are terms that people are probably familiar with. Even before you come into a high school chemistry course, you're usually exposed to the term somewhere in middle school, probably. So you have exothermic and endothermic reactions. An exothermic reaction is going to be, rea is going to be a reaction that will release heat from the system to the surroundings, right? So the heat is being expelled or sent from the system out into the surroundings. And an endothermic reaction is going to be a reaction that must absorb heat from the surroundings into the system. So if you were to have, let's say, a flask or a beaker that has an exothermic reaction going on, if you were to touch the side of the beaker, it would be very hot. And that's because the reaction itself, the system, is losing the heat. It is transferring it to, whether it's the solvent, which is then transferring it to the glass of the beaker or the flask, and then that's transferring it to your hands. You can feel that heat. And the opposite is going to be true for endothermic. So you would be able to feel a noticeable dip in the temperature. It would be cooler to the touch as that reaction is proceeding and is taking in thermal energy from its surroundings in order to kind of power that system and get it moving. Okay, so exo and endothermic. Now, I do want to mention 
there are signs associated with the heat here. So when we look at something that is exothermic in nature, it is typically given a negative value. So we call it negative Q, and it will eventually be negative H, which is the sign for enthalpy. Okay, and this is positive Q. Now, you don't have negative joules or negative heat. That unit would bottom out. There's an absolute zero. You can't have negative energy as far as chemistry goes. However, the plus and the minus can tell you the direction in which that energy is flowing relative to the system. So if we've got a negative Q, what we're saying is that energy is leaving the system and is headed towards the surroundings. It's a loss of that thermal energy. Okay, so we were mentioning enthalpy, and here comes enthalpy. Enthalpy, which is capitalized H, that is how we represent that in uh, chemistry, and you're going to see a lot of times a little triangle next to it. You can see it right down here. We're about to come to it. The triangle means delta, which is change in. So when you see these little triangles in thermodynamics, especially next to these large capital letters, they mean a change in. So it could be a change in the heat of the reaction. It could be a change in the disorderedness or the entropy, a change in the free energy, and so on. All right, so enthalpy is, by definition, the internal energy of a system, and it's going to be defined as the heat plus the work of the system, heat plus work. Now, we're going to define the work of a system as pressure times volume, because again, since we're dealing in chemical terms and we're dealing with atoms and molecules that are bouncing off one another in a container or some sort of reaction vessel, we can view work as pressure times volume in this case. Now, you are going to usually come across the enthalpy in your studies, especially as an undergraduate or somebody in high school, where enthalpy is really just going to be equated to heat. And the key to that is that you have to have a constant pressure, okay? So if your pressure remains the same before and after, meaning it doesn't change, it's a constant pressure, then the work term is going to drop out when you're looking at differences in enthalpy from starting point A to ending point B, okay? And then that change in enthalpy, which we call delta H, is only going to be equal to the heat that is gained or lost by the system in that case. All right, so that is enthalpy, and we can basically state that as delta H is going to equal Q, provided we are at a constant temperature. Okay, so again, delta meaning change in H, enthalpy, is going to simply be equal to Q, and again, Q could be negative. That is simply just defining the direction in which that heat is going, All right? And then again, we're noting here that this must be at constant pressure in order to be a valid statement here. You can certainly uh, not have constant pressure, but then you need to include the work term, the pressure times the volume when you're dealing with that. Okay, so from a stoichiometric standpoint, when we start talking about energy, we want to take a look at this, applying change in enthalpy to reactions, okay? So here's an example of a reaction. We have nitrogen gas and we have hydrogen gas and they are combining together to give ammonia gas. This is a balanced equation. So I've already balanced it. We have two nitrogens on the left and the right and we also have a total of six hydrogens on the left and the right. So you're good to go with that. Everything is in a gaseous state of matter. The delta H for this reaction is negative 91.8 kilojoules. So what that negative means is that we are able to note to ourselves that this is an exothermic reaction because we are going to lose that much heat from the system. It's going to give it off to the surroundings every time we're going to cycle through this reaction. Okay. So applying some stoichiometric knowledge here, how much heat would be released if 9.07 times 10 to the fifth grams of NH3 is produced. So in order to solve this, you would want a periodic table, and I certainly encourage you to pause the video and try, as always, try the problems before you just go through the walkthrough. Right? If you need a periodic table, or since you're watching this on the internet, you could go and look it up real quick if you are nearby a search engine or something like that. Okay, you will need some molar masses in order to deal with this, but other than that, you really just need one. You need the, the ammonia. 
right? So the way that we would set this up, we have a certain amount of ammonia. We have 9.07 times 10 to the fifth grams of ammonia gas. Now, that we need to convert into moles, as we usually do for most stoichiometric calculations. So this is where you would need the periodic table or the head knowledge or a search engine or something like that. Every one mole of ammonia, your nitrogen is 14.01, and the hydrogens are 1.01. .01. I always go to two decimals when I'm doing my molar masses. Okay, so you're going to get 17.04 grams of ammonia gas for every mole of ammonia gas. So how can we determine how much energy is going to be released in this process? Well, we look at the stoichiometric ratio. Every negative 91.8 kilojoules, meaning every 91.8 kilojoules released, we have produced two moles of this ammonia gas. So you're looking at the values here. You're looking at this value, and then you're looking at the stoichiometric value in front of the NH3. So similar to limiting reactants, where we would take a reactant and predict how much product, now we're taking one of these, in this case the product, and predicting how much heat is going to be involved in that process. So what I can do now is I can multiply this. I'm going to want the moles to cancel out because I'm interested in energy, right? How much heat is released. That answer should be in joules. So I'll do my two moles of ammonia. That two number, again, is coming from the balanced equation, the stoichiometric value. And then it's going to be negative 91.8 kilojoules. And I know I sound like a broken record, but again, the negative simply refers to the loss of the energy that is released. Okay, so if you take your time and you put all that into a calculator, what you should get is negative 2.44 times 10 to the 6 kilojoules. Okay. So this is how you could run through some stoichiometric type calculations and you could determine how much energy is going to be released or maybe if it was the opposite, if it was endothermic, how much would be required in order to produce a certain amount and so on. Okay, so that pretty much covers the introduction to enthalpy. Now I do want to make one note here. Some people may be here looking for details on enthalpy related to uh, Hess's law to using those tables where you calculate the products and the reactants and then you do the sum of them and you subtract it from the other and their times their stoichiometric okay if you know standard enthalpy formations is what i'm talking about if you are looking for those there will be videos in this series that covers that but that's just not in this particular lecture uh, they will each warrant their own lecture or will go through them in their own lecture so if you're looking for that just look elsewhere other than that chemcomplete.com We've got resources available for you guys there, including thermodynamic resources. So if you hop on there, you can find lots of free resources if you sign up. There are also paid options that are very, very affordable guides that are 5, 10, 15 bucks. And it is a great way to support the channel. If you have any questions, reach out to me, leave a comment. I'll try to get back to you. Like if the video helped and subscribe to stay up to date throughout the semester. Thank you so much for learning with me and I will see everybody in the next lecture.